Hey everyone, this is David Brown with the migration update for April 20th, 2023 from the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch. Some overnight drizzle cleared out in the early morning and then those cloudy skies gave way to quite a bit of sunshine throughout the day. Winds were out of the east to the east-northeast and were moderate and made it feel chilly even though the temperature really wasn't that cold. Those unfavorable winds kept the amount of migration low, but it also kept the birds that did migrate at low altitude. And with the sunshine, we had a lot of local bird activity. So overall, we ended up getting some pretty good looks. Here's a female belted kingfisher, and we know it's a female because of the brown markings on the underside. Here's one of the local adult Cooper's hawks cruising low to the ground after chasing off a turkey vulture. Notice the long tail and also the large head. And we know it's an adult because of the orange barring underneath. Here we have the Cooper's hawk chasing off another turkey vulture. Here's a male purple martin, which I think is one of the prettiest birds that we see, especially when the light hits it and you really get that flash of purple. We had a couple eastern meadowlarks today. Here's one that perched up in the tree for us. And notice how short the tails are on meadowlarks. Here we have a sharp-shinned hawk overhead. So it's an occipiter, just like the Cooper's hawk, so it has a long tail, but it looks a little less lanky overall than the Cooper's hawk. The tail looks slightly shorter, the head looks smaller, the wings look a little stockier rather than lanky, and the tip of the tail looks a bit squared off because all of the tail feathers are the same length. Here's a nice look at a great blue heron. Here we have another purple martin, and this one's either a female or a juvenile. I'm not really sure how to tell them apart, but it's the adult males that are the completely purple ones, and this is not one of those. Notice that they have somewhat forked tails, and they're our largest swallow species. Here's the Cooper's hawk chasing off another turkey vulture. You might be noticing a pattern here. Here's another bird that the Cooper's hawk tried to chase off less successfully, I should add. And this was a bird that I spotted coming across the marsh down low. And at first it was with a harrier, I think. I thought there were two harriers. I didn't really look that close. And then as this bird got closer, I noticed that it wasn't flying like a harrier. It doesn't have a white rump. And it was just really large. And so I was watching it thinking, okay, this is either a Budio or this is a large exhibitor. And this bird was right down on the marsh, kind of coming at us slightly to the left. And I was just looking with my binoculars, and I even said to the group, I said, I think this is a large exhibitor coming in. And I turned around and went to grab my camera. And when I looked back up, the bird had gone behind the corner pines, which are off in front to our left. And it disappeared. It never came out. If it had come out, we would have seen it, it um, past the tree line. And so I, I had a sense that, hey, this might be a goshawk. And, uh, you know, there were still some red-winged blackbirds giving their alarm calls, so I figured that the bird was in there. Well, then anyway, then the Cooper's hawk came in and it attacked a turkey vulture and then it dove down kind of into the area where we had seen this bird disappear. So I said, okay, the bird must still be in there. We'll just wait it out. And sure enough, uh, a minute or two later, I see it start to fly. And at first it was behind the tree line for us, but then when it broke out, and was flying over the field out in the open. I just went straight for photos and took a lot of photos. And um, sure enough, it turned out to be a juvenile northern goshawk. So it's our third goshawk for the season. Here's a nice top side view of it. So we just see that this is a big exhibitor. Look how broad these wings are. I mean, that's the first thing that stands out about this bird. Just bigger and bulkier than a Cooper's hawk. If we look at the tail we see that the the tail bands kind of have a bit of a wavy pattern to them. And maybe they're less even than on a Cooper's hawk or a sharp-shinned hawk. We also see quite a bit of white speckling on the upper wing, whereas Cooper's hawks are usually a bit more plain on the upper wing. Um, it's not always the easiest field mark to see or to judge, but that's something else we can look at. But just the shape of this bird, this just screams northern goshawk. And this was a huge bird. It was obvious that it was... Uh, the size of like a, a beauty, uh, like a red-shouldered or even a red tail. Here we have a side view of the same bird, and we can see that it's very heavily streaked underneath, and that streaking isn't only on the upper breast like we would see on a Cooper's hawk, but it goes all the way down, even onto the undertail coverts if we had a better angle. 
and the shot's a little bit out of focus, but the thing that really stands out is how broad those wings are. I mean, Cooper's Hawks have more long, lanky wings, but look at this bulge in the secondary. I mean, this bird just comes off as being muscular and massive, so no mistaking this one. Juvenile Northern Goshawk, really exciting bird to see, especially on an otherwise kind of slow raptor day. And as the goshawk flew off, the Cooper's Hawk came and was chasing him again. So kind of funny to see the Cooper's Hawk defending its territory against its larger cousin. And really the size comparison was quite amazing because I would say the goshawk literally looked twice the size of the Cooper's Hawk. That's how big the size difference was. It's just really cool to see. And we had a small school group that was visiting from Buffalo today. They got to see the goshawk and the Cooper's hawk chasing it. And a minute later, we had this sharp-shinned hawk. So they got to see all three exhibitor species in a really short period of time. Again, on the sharpies, look for that small head and really squared off tail tip because all of the tail feathers are the same length. Here's a double crested cormorant and you can even see the crest on the head. Here's another eastern meadowlark, this time down in the grass. And notice that meadowlarks have really pointy tail feathers and that the outer tail feathers are white. About an hour and 45 minutes after that first goshawk sighting, we heard some commotion overhead and looked up. And this bird was getting chased by a couple of crows. And it's a northern goshawk. So presumably the same bird, just because it came back from the, the direction that the other one had gone and it wasn't really a good wind for migration. So I think this was probably the same northern goshawk just hanging around the area. Um, it'll probably go tomorrow when the winds are better, continue its migration. Um, but it was nice that it made another appearance because um, some different people got to see it who hadn't been on the platform for the first sighting, and it was a life bird for at least one person. So congratulations for that life or grace. And here we have a kill deer, which is still the main shorebird that we are seeing. If we take a look at the eBird checklist, I did go to the East Spit in the morning and only had 27 species, not much bird activity. From Braddock Bay Park, I had 57 species, which really isn't too bad with the, the duck variety pretty much gone, hardly any ducks at all out on the bay. And I will point out again that uh, Northern Goshawk is marked as sensitive, as are species like Golden Eagle and Long-Eared Owl. So if you look at my eBird list, you won't be able to see that I reported a Goshawk. If we take a look at hawk count for our migrant raptor totals, today we had 84 turkey vultures, two bald eagles, two northern harriers, four sharp-shinned hawks, one cooper's hawk, one northern goshawk. For beautios, we had two red tails, and the only falcon was one kestrel. For a grand total of 97 migrant raptors today. That brings our April total to 16,453 and the season total to 25,625. There were no new species for the season today. And for visitors, in addition to the school group from Buffalo, we also had a visitor who came all the way from Finland. So nice to meet you today, Timo. And looking at the forecast for tomorrow, you can see I wrote quite the paragraph, which usually means I'm hedging my bets. But the forecast says intervals of clouds and sun with a high in the upper 60s. The winds are going to be light and southerly in the early morning, but it's very likely that that will quickly shift to a lake breeze, um, probably before 10 a.m. if I had to guess. Um, if we had stronger southerly winds, that lake breeze would hold off longer, but hardly any wind at all should go lake breeze on us as the day warms up. And again, that's just because of the difference in temperature between the warm air over the land versus the cold air over the lake. The cold air from the lake comes in and fills in underneath the rising hot air that goes out over the lake. So uh, farther south, there is more of a southerly breeze and there will be a fair amount of sunshine. So I think birds will be on the move tomorrow, including broad-winged hawks. My main concern would be with that lake breeze that they won't make it up to the lake shore. So when that lake breeze kicks in, we'll probably have to move over to Frisbee Hill. And whether or not we'll get the birds over Frisbee Hill is a big question mark. Um, sometimes we get them there. Oftentimes they get pushed even farther in. So we'll just have to go out and see what happens. Um, now, since the winds are relatively light, maybe that means the lake breeze will be light and we'll get the flight over at Frisbee. Um, 
it's just really hard to predict. So we'll have to see what the exact conditions end up being. But overall, I think there's going to be a lot of birds on the move. But unfortunately, um, the broad wings are a bit more affected by that lake breeze since they soar a lot and they're kind of light birds and small. They get pushed in by the lake breeze more than some other species. Things like sharp-shinned hawks and falcons sometimes stay right up on the lake shore over by the platform. So sometimes it comes down to a little bit of a decision. You know, are we staying at the platform to get that flight of exhibitors and falcons? Or do we go to Frisbee Hill where maybe we don't have either flight because the broad wings get pushed farther in and the other stuff's along the lake shore. So we'll have to see. But um, my gut feeling is we'll probably end up over at Frisbee Hill and we'll just hope have to hope that we get a flight overhead there for saturday we're looking at showers early becoming steady rain later so the count will probably not be held and for sunday mostly cloudy skies with a slight chance of a rain shower high around 50 and westerly winds at 10 to 20 miles per hour so it's looking like a, a decent wind direction although cloudy skies and chance of rain that makes things a little bit gloomy that might hold back the flight a little bit we'll keep an eye on that as we get closer and I was saddened to learn today about the death of Eric Anderson. Eric was a local birder in my home area of Williamsport, Pennsylvania. You'd often see him out in the summertime on the Williamsport Riverwalk riding his recumbent bike. And he'd always stop and chat about birds and ask what you were seeing and tell you what he had been seeing. So just a really great guy to chat with and uh, always a pleasure to, to see him out there riding his bike. And uh, he'll definitely be missed. I think the first time I met Eric was at the Route 15 Overlook, and this was long before I was doing hawk watching as a job, but I had kind of started to do it just on my own as a hobby, going up to the Route 15 Overlook and posting on the local listserv that I was going up there, and uh, various people would stop by and say hello, and it was kind of a fake it till you make it point of my life because... I didn't really have the hawk watching experience, but I kind of knew that maybe that's what I wanted to work towards. And I just remember Eric coming up one day and introducing himself and getting to, getting to know him and chatting. And then um, over the years since then, just running into him out on the Williamsport River Walk as he was riding his bike and I was out birding. So um, again, a really great guy and uh, we'll, we'll all miss him. And really he's... Uh, he wasn't that old. I remember I went to college with his daughter, so he's right around the age of my parents. So just a really sad, sudden loss. Well, I hope a tribute like that can help us all reflect on enjoying the time that we have together and uh, enjoying every day out at the Hawk Watch. So I hope to see some of you soon out at the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch platform. From Lyco Birds, this is David Brown. Thanks for watching.